this is the second to last presentation. And as I worked my way through the uh, the transcript of the uh, LBL from uh, 2006, so I'm picking up where I left off this morning. Matt breathes deeply. What do you need to do now, Sean? I need to go back to meet the Christ figure. Matt, do you see him? Sean, yes, we're walking on a forest path together. And I feel the extraordinary wisdom and compassion and enlightenment and agelessness emanating from him. And I know that he has intersected with the history of this little planet many times. And he kind of shakes his head in amazement that anybody would make the claim that it only happened once and then construct a religion around that. He's a true bodhisattva who long, long, if I want to use human terminology, long, 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 long ago could have merged totally with different dimensions of the manifest realms in order to raise the vibrations and encourage the enlightenment, not just in this little planet, but on lots of other planets and universes that are beyond us and incomprehensible to human thought. But he has intersected with this planet many times. And I've had the privilege of intersecting with him on one or two occasions when he's been here. Which is why I've been really fascinated this lifetime with what he really came to do and what really got messed up so badly. What's it like to be in his presence? That says, Sean, total, total calm. Matt, is there a reason you're visiting him? Sean, yes, there is. Because in this lifetime as Sean, I've opted to be born into a culture and a community that thought they were honoring his message. Part of my job was try to see if I could be some kind of a force or some kind of a teacher to help together with others, to extract what he was really about. And to do that, I merged very fully with a lot of prejudices and beliefs and dogma of an organization. And the reason I want to spend time with him now is that over maybe the last 20 years of Sean's life, I have been challenging and separating from and addressing just how badly this message of inner divinity has been trampled and put through the ringer of dogma and belief systems. And I want to, I want to get the insights and the courage and the wisdom to try to represent something of this extraordinary being. I want to try to absorb some of that ability to teach and be present And I hear from him that teaching is only effective when it verbalizes what people already know. That the worst kind of teaching is the effort to try to put information into an empty can. And that all real teaching is about touching the soul that already knows and awaken the spark of recognition. And that to be a true teacher, you have to feel that in your core and recognize it at the core of the person you're speaking with. And that there can be no timeline attached to this education process. It has to unfold in its own way, in its own time. And sometimes it ends disastrously, and sometimes it ends gloriously, but it's never really ended. Both the disasters and the triumphs are an illusion. Matt, is there something you need to teach now? 
Sean, yes, there is. It's the teaching that no single one of us is less a son of God than Jesus was. And then to realize that if we can recognize that and claim that as our own true origin and core, then we have to recognize that as the true origin and core of everybody else. Otherwise, it's just pure hubris. Otherwise, it's just the ego hijacking the insight. Matt, anything else? Yes, Sean. Yes, I feel that the journey forward in other lifetimes after this one would be to remember more quickly, to roll back the amnesia faster each lifetime. Matt, do you want to say something to him? Sean, I make a joke and I tell him, come back, dude, we're in deep doo-doo. Anything else? Yeah. That in, that in all the lifetimes and the one or two occasions when we have intersected in a particular lifetime and the very many ones in which we haven't had his example and energy, he has been the single most important inspiration to me. Matt, anything else? Yeah, Sean. Yeah, he's telling me that I have to love enough to conquer my own fear and then love enough to conquer my anger against others. Matt, the others are the purveyors of prejudice. Sean, yeah. Those who deal in prejudices and violence and narrow-minded bigotry. Matt, what's the fear inside yourself? Sean, The, feel, the fear is that I'm inadequate, that I'm not really measuring up to what I signed up for and volunteered for, or the fear that I'll go back to sleep, even for a while. Matt, anything else? Sean, I think we're complete. Matt, what now? Sean, I've asked for permission to visit the launching pad for souls who are on the way right now just to see what happens there, who's getting ready to come in and what their missions are. It's a really exciting place. It's like the dressing room of a football team before the Super Bowl. Lots of excitement. Coaches and mentors and players And then a hush descends in the hall, and there's silence. And there's a figure who's orchestrating this entire event. And it's as if this figure is in contact with every single person in the hall, intimate contact, including the, on including the onlookers lookers like myself. And somehow this being manages to set up a network of interlocking intelligences that allows every one of the participants to experience what the others are feeling and thinking and planning. And it's as if every one of the players can draw information and encouragement from all of the others, including the bystanders. Matt, did you come here for a reason or were you just curious? Sean, yeah, because my energy, some of my energy, is on planet Earth right now. And I'm going to intersect with some of these beings in the years ahead. They are going to be born as little babies in the very near future in Earth time. And they'll come across each other. Matt, are these babies, uh, do they hold your energy? Sean, 
There's a lot of really, really advanced souls in that group. A few neophytes, but a lot of advanced ones there. And they're going to be spread out all over the globe, every race and color, every possible birth circumstance and socioeconomic group. It's been happening for a while, but I get to witness this, this particular batch. And what's coming through in this meeting of minds, orchestrated and coordinated by this leader, is that many of these entities will not become famous people. They'll apparently be very ordinary, doing ordinary things in ordinary kinds of relationships. But they're going to be conduits for very different kinds of energy for everybody. Some of them will be famous. They'll be when lone, but that's not important. They're just different players on the same team. And there's an excitement in this group. Many of these are veterans of other worlds, other times, when they've done the same thing in other places. There's a real sense. There is no fear in this group when they're together as a group. Fear will come later when they incarnate and forget for a while. But this group is going to rem remember more quickly and let go of the fear much faster. Now, what's really bonding them is the stories and the memories of other safaris into other dimensions and other worlds at other times for the same kind of mission. And they have no doubt that they will succeed. No doubt whatsoever. And there are other onlookers besides myself, some of whom are not incarnated now and don't plan to come in immediately, but they're feeding off this energy. And they're going to bring it back to their soul groups. And they're going to be like a web of cheerleaders, themselves sending energy and support for the project. All of these have had experiences already on planet Earth. All of them have understood firsthand what it feels like to be victimized or discriminated against or to be crucified or executed or demeaned or hungry. And as they pay very close attention to this little planet of ours over the last period of time, the level of pain, suffering and disillusionment and the utter inadequacy of the institutions to heal has been crying out for a remedy. Matt, so you take heart, Sean? Totally, totally. And I have this funny sense that over the next 15 years that I'm going to meet some of these people and say, wake up already, remember already. Matt, have you met them in this life? Sean, the Sean life? Yeah. I felt like I was volunteering to merge with one of the most successful organizations in recorded human history. An organization that had been founded on a mystical teaching, but which ra had rather quickly descended into institutional bureaucracy. That I needed to merge with it so that I could try to be some kind of a leader for some of the members to rediscover our roots. And I knew that this body was going to have the privilege of living for extended periods of time in three different continents, in Europe, in Africa, and in America. And that I would get the opportunity of being part of a community with 1,500 years of tradition in Ireland and no history of Christian tradition in Africa. Matt, what was your task? I think part of the task I was setting myself this time 
was to really, really get it while still incarnate. Firstly, in my head level, and then at my soul level, that all apparent differences between sentient beings are illusory. That we are neither separated from each other, or from nature, or from God. And that I really, really wanted to get that in my incarnated soul, my jiva, as distinct from my excarnated soul, my atma. That I wanted to shatter the amnesia significantly and to wake up enough that I would stay awake. And that I would never again be fooled by form. And that I could learn to walk with a foot in both realities, the non-incarnated soul energy of God time and the incarnated temporal energy of earth time. And to walk in both of these realities at the same time, honoring incarnation while never forgetting my true identity or the identity of anybody with whom I walked. Matt, the ones on the launching pad, do you have anything to say to them? Sean, I just want to wish them bon voyage and tell them I'll see you on the other side. And it's funny saying that because normally we say that from Earth as they are leaving Earth. And now I'm saying it to those who are going to Earth. So Francis' question is, what helps most to stay awake, remember? Right off the top of my head, spend time with little children, little ones, those under age four or five, because they remember. And in their, in their play, in their imaginative play, and their imaginative friends who are not imaginary in the sense in which adults think they're imaginary, they're still in contact through the veil on a regular basis until we send them to school. And they're told that's crazy. There's no such thing as such and such a friend spending time with little children and joining in their games, not patronizingly tapping their head, and, you know, good job, but really journey with them and go where they're taking you because they're taking you through the veil really, really fast. And so I would say that's the most important single one, spend time with little children and then spend time with animals. If you've got a pet, a cat or a dog or whatever, and be aware of the fact that their the range of their sensorium is much greater than mine, that they have some kind of telepathic abilities, that they're sensing energies that uh, humans are not sensing, that there's some kind of uh, an intuitive process going on and they have access to altered states or at least extended ranges of the sensorium. And so watch what your animals are doing. The next one I would say would be spend time out in nature. Watch spiders building webs, you know, watch leaves dancing in the wind, you know, watch the way that a little stream creates little eddies and goes around in circles for a while and then rejoins the current again. Um, watch how nature solves its problems. It does it really, really elegantly. There's no, there's nothing you can do to nature from which it will not recover or to which it will not adapt, no matter how badly we treat it. And it will far outlive the homo, homo sapiens sapiens, you know. And that um, planet Earth itself I believe it literally has seven levels of body, just like the Hindus teach about the human body. You know, in Hinduism, they talk about the gross body, which is vibrating between infrared and ultraviolet before between 400 and 700 nanometers. And so we can see it and taste it and feel it and touch it. Then the second level of body, they call the etheric body. It's the, the body that you sometimes see in saints with the halo around the system. There's a kind of a spectrum, a sheath of, of light surrounding it, the etheric body or the energy template from which the, of which the physical body is simply a printout or a hard copy. And then you've got a third level, you've got the astral body, which is the place where our emotions reside. And it is the body we inhabit when we're dreaming at night. That's the one that can um, travel huge distances in no time. There's no time and there's no space involved at the astral level. So, you know, I can have a dream tonight about my grandfather who died in 1956, and I find myself in my bedroom as a, uh, a nine-year-old child talking to my grandfather who was dead since 1956 because there is no time and there's no space at the astral level, you know. And Hinduism teaches that 
that is the level at which all of the information from the incarnation just ended is archived. So it's all stored at the astral body level to be picked up again on the way back down in a reincarnational experience. And the fourth level is the mental body, uh, what Plato would call the ideal realm, or Jung would call the kind of the, the place of the archetypes, uh, the level of uh, mentation, mentation that allows us access to the ideal forms of everything, including geometrical shapes. Plato, you know, and um, Pythagoras believed that there were actually ideal shapes that could not be accurately replicated on planet Earth. You can't draw a perfect circle, no matter how hard you try, because your compass or whatever you're using is, you know, there's a there's a point to it, which is going to change as you transcribe the circle or the roughness of the paper is going to distract it. So there's an ideal form, and then there's the kind of the, the hard copy on planet Earth, so that's the fourth level. So sometimes many of our great ideas are downloaded from the mental body level. And then the fifth level is the psychic body, the place at which we uncover our psychic abilities, clairaudience, clairsentience, clairvoyance, uh, telepathy, precognition, uh, that they're all, they're all part of who we are. And then the, uh, the, the sixth level is the soul, the soul self, and it's the level at which uh, it's the, pla the place of the Akashic Records, the place where all of the memories and all of the experiences generated by all of our incarnations are stored, you know, and which again are unloaded when we come back down for our future re reincarnation. And then finally, there's there's union with source. The seventh level is uh, 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 Brahman itself. Though I believe that there are seven levels to the planet itself, that there is um, a, a physiosphere, which emerged 4.6 billion years ago as part of this uh, this part of the solar system of ours. So it's the, the third rock from the sun in this solar system, and it's studied by physics. It's a physiosphere, and so we're studying the the, kind of the composition of the rock. There's another level of the body that um, we might call the um, the atmosphere, and the atmosphere for me is the womb of the planet. It is the sheath of energy surrounding the physiosphere that allows it to kind of conceive and give birth. And then that creates the next level of the of the planet, which is the biosphere. So now it's going to give birth uh, flor first to uh, uh, flora and then subsequently to fauna. And so, uh, so the, there's the physiosphere, the atmosphere, which is the womb, and then the biosphere, which is the place of life. And then there's a fourth level called, Tyler de Sharda called it the noosphere. And the noosphere is the um, the sheath of consciousness that surrounds the biosphere. And um, it's a very, very dangerous uh, uh, set part of, of the progress because at this stage we're making kind of global contact with each other. So we have stuff like the internet connecting everybody immediately to everybody else. But it's the level at which we can develop technology capable of utterly destroying ourselves or radically altering who we are through a kind of a chan, a transhumanist agenda that will turn us into robots who are just a programmable, programmable you know, and kind of um, hackable entities. So the movement from biosphere to noosphere is fraught with danger. It's like the asteroid belt in, in, the, in, the, in the physical cosmos. But if we negotiate that and we get through that stage, the next stage up I call the anima sphere, anima as in soul, and it's the level of the planet which is the, the soul self of the planet itself uh, that volunteered for incarnation as a planet. And then the level above that I call the pneuma sphere, pneuma as in spirit sphere, and then ultimately the cosmosphere. So the planet itself has all these different levels. And so in direct response to what you're asking, Fancy, um, nature is an extraordinary teacher. And by nature, I don't just mean, uh, I do mean, but not just mean spending time in the forest and watching leaves and spiders but watching the, the heavens at night, watching the kind of the stars, you know, so looking out deeply into into outer space. That's part of what I mean to, to be in nature as well. You know, one final thing I would say is, um, if you want to wake up more quickly, is uh, some kind of a practice of meditation where you're accessing your core self. So they, these would be some of the practices that would help you wake up uh, more quickly. Because we're all teachers for each other. You know, even in a designated relationship where one, one person ostensibly is the teacher and another group of people are the students, we're all teaching each other, absolutely all teaching each other. We're just playing different roles on, this, on the same team. So I got a comment again that uh, adding to that the kind of list of practices is music. 
and uh, the example of people like Leonard Cohen, you know, and John Lennon, so the great musicians that they have added extraordinarily to our, our awakening process. So I absolutely agree with you. Music would be another practice. Yes. Yeah. So David's question is again about this notion of a personal experience he had in which he encountered a feminine aspect of himself that seemed to be a higher self. So I'm totally convinced that the soul, which is infinite, does not uh, um, does not spend you know all of its energy in an incarnation. And so in, in some way, no matter how many ways you spit infinity, it's still infinite. And so the fact that an infinite being is spending time in a human spacesuit or in several simultaneous parallel lifetimes uh, doesn't significantly diminish the energy that remains at source. And so you can call that the higher self, you can call it the Atman, uh, you can call it the soul self, whatever you call it. It's the realization that, you know, there's a contract that goes on between the portion of the soul that's uh, volunteering for the limitations of a spacesuit and the part that's up there to keep reminding it of who, it's really, who it really is and what its function is. And so when you significantly shift your state of consciousness, such as you, David, did in a, a Life Between Life sessions, when you get out of identification with your mind and your ego and your physicality and your relationships, you know, you're free then to be in contact with your source self. You know, and at that stage, you're going to get uh, information, you know, and insights that are not available when you're just trying to operate through this little, little uh, piece of wetware between your ears. So jo Johanna's comment is about another practice perhaps is getting in touch with one's inner child, that kind of imaginative part of us. Um, I agree completely uh, with one little caveat that in, in modern psychotherapy, the notion of an inner child very, very often is kind of conflated with the suffering little child that got brutalized or mistreated or, you know, that very often that's in psychology, uh, people will make that association very often. And that the inner child is the suffering part that wasn't recognized, you know, and that somehow needs to be um, healed in some way. But I get the sense that when you're talking about the inner child, you're talking about uh, the soul self, the innocence of childhood. Now, that's hugely important. And um, no less a teacher than Jesus himself will say that. There's one famous incident where he's walking along the road and his disciples are 100 yards behind him and they're arguing. So he stops and he waits for them to catch up and he says, what were you arguing about on the road? And they're really embarrassed because they were arguing about which of them was, was the most important and that when Jesus came, when Jesus became the king of Israel, you know, who was going to be the minister of finance and the minister for education and the minister for foreign affairs or whatever, so they're really embarrassed. So call, Jesus called over a little child. Obviously, there's a lot of women with little children around. He called a little child. He pointed to the child and he says, unless you become like a little child, you won't even enter the kingdom of God let alone be given portfolios, important portfolios. So I thought often about what did Jesus recognize in the, in the child that was so important? And the first one is that children have an extraordinary sense of awe at the world. They're absolutely fascinated by everything around them, including you know, turning over stones to find the you know, kind of worms or, you know, drawing on the toilet wall with their own poop. They're just fascinated by everything that, that they experience. So that's the first thing he says that kids have this extraordinary uh, uh, curiosity and sense of awe around life, which is interesting because there's a statement in the Hebrew scriptures that says, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. The problem is that that's been totally mistranslated in the Hebrew. Uh, the original Hebrew is rather the awe at God is the beginning of wisdom, not fear of God, not trembling in front of this monster, but a sense of awe in the presence of the transcendent is the beginning of wisdom. And kids have that, that, that sense of awe. So they're on the they're on the threshold of an, of the transcendent all the time. The second thing he saw in children was their extraordinary ability to ask really important questions. But they're questions that we as adults have kind of dismissed as foolish questions. And I remember as a small child, I was age about four. I'm living with my grandparents, my paternal grandparents. I have seven aunts and uncles. I got my great grandmother and my great grandfather living there as well. So it's a big household of people. And we'd be gathered around the table for, for a dinner in the evening, you know. And I remember they were talking, so this was uh, about 1950. And they'd talk constantly about the war. They would never say World War II, it was just called the war. And I'm listening to this, you know, again and again and again. So one evening I pop up and I said to my grandmother, um, I used to call her Big Mammy, Big Mammy, how long did the war last? 
And I'm thinking she's going to say, well, it started at 9.30 in the morning and it went on until 4.15 in the afternoon. And she says, it went on for six years. I say, what? And I'm totally incredulous. And then I start asking my questions and everybody keeps cracking up. I say, what happened when it got dark? I mean, how can you be fighting if it's dark outside? And everybody cracked up. And then I said, um, and what happened when you had to go to the toilet? You know, how could there be a world war going on if you had to go to the bathroom? And everybody cracked up. And then the kind of cling was, I said, um, what happened on Sunday when they had to go to Mass? And everybody cracked up. So I was asking really, really important questions as a child. But the adults, you know, thought these were all stupid little childish kind of questions. They were the real questions. And kids always ask the real questions. So the third thing I see about it is that kids are born prejudice-free. They do not see you know, what adults teach them exists. You know, so they're totally prejudice-free. An ex example of this, the last mission I was in in Kenya was a very remote area called Kip Saruman. And uh, on the compound one day, this woman arrived on the compound completely naked, a really, really obese and she's sitting down just outside uh, the, the mission and she's breastfeeding a little boy child who looked like he was about six months of age. And you know, as mothers, if you've had the privilege of, birth, of uh, um, breastfeeding a child, when the child is suckling, you know, typically one hand is on the mother's face and is trading the contours of her face and just getting to know the mother, lovingly attached uh, to, the, to the face of the mother. So here's this little boy child, about six months, sucking on her breast and kind of looking at her features with his, with his fingers. And uh, I'm looking on and I'm thinking, wow, this little kid thinks that this woman is God. And she is, as far as he's concerned. But by age six or seven or eight, people say to him, your mother is crazy. She's a total crazy woman. Indeed, she was schizophrenic. Uh, but the child didn't say that. The child would have to be taught that his mother was a crazy woman. But he, you know, instinctively, she was guided to the child. So they're born prejudice-free. That's what Christ saw on them. And then the fourth thing was, when I came to the States in 1987, I spent a few weeks with a friend of mine down in uh, Encinitas, uh, near San Diego. He was a, a priest. He ordained with me, but then he uh, incarnated into the, uh, got incarnated, uh, it's a legal term in, in uh, ecclesiology. He got incarnated into the Diocese of San Diego. So I spent a few weeks with him. And I remember this, the morning newspaper arrived and there's a photograph of a big buxom policewoman carrying a little child and the child is reaching back over her shoulder. And the child has been taken away by Child Protective Services because the mother had been uh, physically abusing the child. She was stubbing out cigarette butts on the child's skin as the child's body is covered with cigarette burns. And he's been taken away now by the, by the CPS and this policewoman. But the child is desperately trying to get back to the mother. Because in spite of the abuse it's experienced, you know, he desperately wants to be reunited with his mother. So the extraordinary partial of um, kids to forgive the indignities to which they're subjected, you know, that that's what Christ is saying, the ability to forgive. And the final piece, I think, was Christ saw in children the ability to, uh, to, to uh, walk backwards and forwards through the veil, the veil between the mystical and the mundane. And so he's saying uh, these are all the attributes you know, of the kingdom. So I totally agree, uh, Johanna, that accessing your inner child when you kind of separate it from a kind of a, a psychotherapeutic notion, you know, that um, becoming uh, united again with the inner child is a hugely important practice. And Michael's question is the issue of inadequacy. How did I deal with it personally when I encountered it in this uh, uh, thing that happened to me in 2006? And how, how what do I do with clients uh, when I uh, uh, speak to my clients with these kinds of issues? And the first thing is that in some senses, the ego is an extraordinarily uh, manipulative mechanism. And so the ego is prepared to use any and all situations to kind of justify itself. So even the fear of being inadequate is already the ego's attempt to feel superior. And so uh, by appearing to be inadequate or feeling I'm inadequate, I'm going to now kind of um, harvest all of the relationships in my life to feed my ego to have people tell me, no, you're not inadequate, you're doing a great job or whatever. And so that uh, the fear of an inadequacy is a thinly disguised ego trip because the ego is like your typical politician. Politicians achieve nothing of value, but when they see a movement which seems to have a promise, they run around in front of it and pretend to be leading it. Now, the ego does the same thing. The ego is, is happy to try to um, capture any enterprising um, kind of process in human life 
and then uh, try to somehow uh, claim responsibility for it. And so it's a really devious mechanism. You know, the, the ego is important and, and vital for living in an incarnated life. It makes a great uh, servant, but it makes a terrible master. And so the, the feeling of inadequacy then very often is a thinly disguised, narcissistic kind of uh, technique to a kind of um, rope in other people to tell me I'm okay and put me at the center of their lives or make me a priority in some way so that uh, I can feel better about, my, about myself. So in, in thinking about my own feeling of inadequacy, I recognized really quickly that that's what it was. And in working with other people, realizing that maybe they're even using me as a psychotherapist to tell, no, you're not, you're doing a great job, you're a fabulous person, whatever. And so rather than doing that, I went to try to uncover for them how much ego is involved in that, uh, in that issue, in that fear for you. Can you identify where the ego is involved? And then, you know, there may be circumstances where they've, they've failed in projects, even important projects like a marriage or, or a job or whatever. And then you can start dealing with uh, those kinds of data as well. But you have to first uh, uncover what the chief kind of driver of this feeling of inadequacy is. Right, so Andrea is making, making comments again about the inner child and the sense of uh, uh, playfulness that's right, really important, exactly as Christ pointed out and that Johanna had mentioned the inner play. And she's added to that as well, the notion of dancing as a, a spiritual technique. And, then, and she mentioned the, the, uh, the rising kundalini, the spiral that comes up the spine. In Hinduism, it's the meeting of the ida and the pingala, the earth energy that moves from the bottom up from the spine up to the top of the head. And the other energy that comes from the top of the head down to the down through the spine. So the kundalini experience of the um, the spiraling activity, rather than a kind of a circular motion uh, or a linear progression. And so the spiraling and dancing, any art form, I think, uh, really undertaken well. Any art form, whether it's music or dancing or artwork or sculpting, which is done in a channeling modality, where the artist uh, gets out of the way and provides just a container for the divine to speak through her that any of these are really important. And uh, to, to address the dancing piece particularly, uh, so many different traditions have uh, for, I've talked about the importance of movement, like in the um, Rudolf Steiner with Eurythmia, you know, or in the Kundalini experience, or, you know, the Whirling Dervishes again. And you'll notice um, little children, and this seems to me to be particularly true for little girl children, you know, they're walking along the street with their mother, but they're not walking along the street. They're skipping along the street and they're dancing along the street. They don't go from A to B in the measured footsteps. They dance their way along the sidewalk. And this seems to be, for me, a kind of an embodiment of the female energy of the divine, because you see it much more in little girls than little boys. My experience at least is that. So that ability that they're so filled with the divine energy that, you know, they're not just trying to get from A to B ever. They're trying to kind of just um, experience the uh, the energy of the body, this new container that they've recently kind of uh, taken occupancy of, and they're trying it out, and they're figuring, you know, what works here, and how can I optimize uh, the, uh, the, the physicalness of myself? And so dancing then would be a hugely important part of it. Anything you see little children doing is going to be important. Marlene is talking about a new kind of technique for accessing uh, that the altered states of consciousness using a technique called dream tending, um, where you're interacting in, in, a, in a waking state and moving accordingly and interacting with uh, energies and entities that introduce themselves. Um, so it, it, feel, it feels to me like it's in some senses, it's um, a waking state version of lucid dreaming, where at nighttime, as you're dreaming, you become aware of the fact that you are dreaming and you have some level of control over the, how you direct the dream, whether you want to investigate particular kinds of areas, but you're doing this in a waking consciousness. That's the first idea that comes to me when I hear you speak, Marlene. The second one I look at in the Hebrew language, and particularly in, in the Hebrew Bible, that um, they, they don't discriminate between dreams and visions, that a dream is a vision you have when you're asleep, and a vision is a dream that you have when you're awake. So it's the same reality. You're tapping into the same uh, reality. And when you look at the Aboriginal peoples, particularly in Australia, they talk about dream time and that uh, they're, they're living in a level of, uh, uh, of time which is out of sync with our chronological linear version of time. And they, they're entering into a state in which they believe that the, the entire physical universe was created by the, um, by the music of the ancestors 
and that it's by being in dream time that you make associations and connections with them. So obviously this uh, this uh, teacher that you mentioned, you know, is tapping into a, a, a very, very wide level of wisdom that you find uh, globally, the realization that our, our dreams are not just kind of the reshuffling of the day's furniture in some kind of a, a hypnotic kind of sleepy stays, but that rather you have access to other dimensions of the self and other dimensions of reality and learning then to kind of um, utilize that for psychological and spiritual evolution for healing purposes and for a kind of a shamanistic connections with others. Right. Thanks a million for sharing that, Marlene.